the first test is to do that without that happening. <laughs> you know, hold that, raise it up a bit. I remember Spencer doing that and thinking, I hope that doesn't happen for me. <laughs> first thing, <laughs> too late. Well, it has been uh, many years before I had the opportunity to, to speak. Um, I think if I remember way back when my son was just a few months old at the time, um, I had probably, now I have a few more gray hairs and probably a little less hair overall. Um, not to say that's due to raising my son, I didn't mean to make that <laughs> connection with that. When I used to print out messages, I could read 12 size font. Now we're at 14 here. <laughs> Got reading glasses this year. Um, so, and I know that it's been several years since I have been, so I might you know, may perhaps be a little bit, uh, a little bit rusty, but I, I am pleased to have the opportunity to come and speak uh, this morning. I'm wondering, first off, as I begin, how many of you at, at some point have ever felt like a failure? <laughs> okay, hands down. Perhaps you've tried something and just came up short, uh, maybe feeling a bit defeated. I know I felt like a failure many times in my life, and that's not easy for me to admit because I'm a very high-achieving individual. But as a child, I failed at being a good son. As a teenager, I failed my first driver's test. As a young adult, I failed at being a caring boyfriend. As a university student, I failed Math 233A Matrix Algebra. <laughs> As a minister, I failed at being an effective youth pastor. I have failed at being a good speaker. Oops, where did that one come from? I didn't want to share that one. Someone must have slipped that in my notes. You're probably thinking, uh-oh, he's just started. That's not a good sign for us now that uh, he's got us captive. But just before uh, I, I continue, I'd like to show a, a short uh, clip of someone just coming up slightly short of their goal, but ultimately failing. It's one of my favorite actors, the name of Kevin James. He is uh, playing the role of Paul Blart, mall cop, and he desperately wants to be a police officer, but it's just as under his reach. So take a look. completed the written exam. However, you must now pass the obstacle course to be admitted into the training program. And remember, survive this and you're on the front lines of keeping New Jersey safe. Like Paul Blart, Mall Cop, we've all experienced these moments where we feel that we just don't measure up. We get so close, but we just don't make it. But I continue for myself and my list of failures. I've failed at being a true friend. I've failed at being a good teacher. I have failed at being a loving husband and father. I've failed at being an effective vice principal. And I've failed in my relationship with Christ. Now, you must be thinking, this is pretty depressing. You know, you're probably thinking, who is this loser up here sharing this morning? <laughs> you know. uh, but seriously, although I have felt like a failure many times, I do not consider myself to be a failure. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, but did anyone relate to any of my many fails? Did anyone fail their driver's test the first time? Anyone? Yeah, several hands have gone up. You know, if so, which ones? And if you don't mind sharing some of your own, perhaps with the person next to you, you know I've been 
vulnerable up here. And if you don't want to share what the actual failure is, perhaps you could take a moment to share how you felt about yourself in that moment. So please go ahead. Talk with the person next to you. Hopefully that has been uh, enough time. We could probably go on for a long time talking about this. But I'm hoping and wondering if you shared how you felt in the moment of your failure, um, if you still feel that way now. And have you ever felt like a failure as a Christian, that you let God down? And let's focus on that uh, as we continue, because when we fail, our inclination is just to give up, to take our bat and ball and go home. Hopefully, though, we get back into the game. We dust ourselves off and we try again. We get help so we can succeed the next time. Perhaps we even fail again. But do we take two steps forward and three steps back or three steps forward and two steps back? And how should we respond to our failures as a Christian? And how does God respond to our failures when we let him down? Let's take a look at God's word at a particular portion of scripture where we could say that one of Jesus' disciples struck out and let him down. And let's see how it all turns out. If you could take a moment, if you have your Bibles, to look at Luke chapter 22. And if you don't have your, your Bibles, we will have it on the overhead above. Luke chapter 22, just to put it in context here, we're at the, it's at the Last Supper. We're going to pick up in verse 33. And it goes as follows. But he, Peter, replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Now we know from the other gospels that Peter's comment to this was, quote, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And that's back in Matthew chapter 26 and Mark chapter 14. Uh, as many of you know, Peter's going to be eating his words here, isn't he? Let's pick up in verse 54 of the same chapter, Luke 22. This is now after Jesus was arrested. Then seizing him, referring to Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. Strike one. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. Strike two. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you are talking about. Strike three. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. It would be like the umpire saying, you're out. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now, the important part of this passage is not that Peter struck out, not that he denied Jesus three times, but his response to his actions. He went outside and wept bitterly. He knew what he had done and had felt remorse. He felt guilty. But does it end there? And sadly, it does for some believers, but not Peter. Now, I deliberately left out verses 31 and 32 of this chapter as I began reading. Let's take a look at that now. Jesus is speaking, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now we know from these verses that Jesus has called Peter to do something important. 
But isn't it interesting, Jesus says, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus is saying this to the person he knows will soon deny him three times. But what is it that Jesus has called Peter, the denier of Jesus, to do? Well, let's take a look. It's in Matthew chapter 16. If you take a moment to look in Matthew 16. And Peter is asked by Jesus, this is before his denial, who do you say that I am? In Matthew 16, beginning in verse 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, which means rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. To the person who ends up betraying him, Jesus builds his church on? What? This makes no sense. Peter's given the keys to the kingdom of heaven? What gifts? And I know that this passage is where we get the idea that Peter is standing at the gates of heaven, and he's the first person we meet there. And oftentimes we hear that more in heaven jokes than we do actually in scripture. But this is kind of where that passage came to be. This is also the passage where Roman Catholics consider Peter to be the first pope and to base papal succession on. And a quick look back to what I mentioned earlier is the important part of the end of Luke chapter 22 is not that Peter struck out three times, and deny Jesus, but rather the response to his actions, that Peter had repented and turned back. Despite the fact that he struck out, he didn't just end things there. He got back into the game, so to speak. He returned to God, a broken, sorrowful person, having learned a thing or two about himself and God, I'm sure. And after Jesus died and rose again, he appeared to his disciples and to others more than once. And on one occasion, in John chapter 21, Jesus reinstates Peter and Peter confirms his commitment to him. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt now because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And one might wonder why Jesus asks Peter this question three times. To briefly answer this, I have a short video clip that addresses this issue. And the person who did this puts it much more succinctly than I could. Please take a look. Did you ever want to know why Jesus asks the Apostle Peter, do you love me three times in the Gospel of John? Well, Jesus doesn't ask this same question over and over to Peter because he is hard of hearing or slow to comprehend Peter's answers. The fact that he asks Peter, do you love me three times, is very significant. First of all, numbers are often used in the Bible to make a point and express meaning. For example, the number 40 represents a significant period of time during which one's faith is tested, such as Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, or the Israelites' 40 years wandering the desert on their way to the Promised Land. The number 12 represents wholeness or perfection of government, such as the 12 apostles or the 12 tribes of Israel. And the number three is one of those good numbers you find in the Bible, for it is on the third day that God saves. Jonah is released from the belly of the whale on the third day. Saul, who will become St. Paul, regains his eyesight on the third day. And of course, Jesus is raised from the dead on the third day. Now Peter, if you recall, denied even knowing Jesus, let alone being one of his closest disciples, three times right before Jesus' crucifixion. However, when Jesus appears to the disciples after his resurrection, he brings forgiveness, not retribution. To those who deserted him before his death, Jesus says, Shalom, which means peace. And to Peter, who denied him three times, 
Jesus offers a threefold opportunity for forgiveness. Peter is hurt when Jesus asks him a third time, most likely because it makes him recall his own threefold denial of Jesus. This story emphasizes the prominence of Peter among the apostles and demonstrates how, despite his denial, Peter is restored, reconciled with Jesus through Jesus' own forgiveness of sins. Finally, this story presents to us some good questions we need to ask ourselves on a daily basis. Do we love Jesus? And how do we show this love to our friends, family, and the world around us? And that's all part of why Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Jesus restores Peter, forgives him, and gives him three opportunities to confirm his love for him. And it's significant that Jesus asked him to feed my sheep. Uh, this is important as he, instructed to, he was instructed to tend, to care for, and to provide spiritual food for God's people, from the youngest lambs to the full-grown sheep, to nourish and care for their souls, bringing them into the fullness of spiritual maturity. The food is the word of God, so people can mature in their salvation. Now, this is a large task for someone who had previously failed Jesus to now be responsible for other salvation and maturity as believers. So let's take a look at Peter a little bit later. Let's see how this denier of Jesus turned out and see how he accomplished what Jesus had asked him to do, the so-called person whom Jesus builds his church on. It's in Acts chapter 4, beginning of verse 7. Take a moment to turn there, but just before we do that, a little bit of background on some of the things in the book of Acts related to Peter. At this point, Peter and John were put in jail. They're put in jail for teaching about the resurrection of Jesus. Also, just prior to this, they had healed a crippled beggar. And after this, later on, Peter raises the disciple named Tabitha, also named Dorcas, from the dead in Jesus' name. Now, a little aside, I wouldn't recommend naming your daughter Dorcas, you know, um, as the first syllable of Dork might later become a name-calling issue. Um, but you should know that Tabitha is Aramaic and Dorcas is Greek, and they actually both mean gazelle, which means beautiful. But again, I haven't seen Dorcas in many of the top ten names for girls. Anyway, we see that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit and proclaims Jesus' name in front of the Sanhedrin, or in front of the Jewish tribunal. Acts chapter 4, verse 7 says, They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is, and he quotes from the Old Testament now, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Is this the same wishy-washy Peter, the one who had denied Jesus three times? You bet it is. Following Peter striking out, he got back into the game. And from this passage and his words and his later actions, I'd say he hit a home run, wouldn't you? Peter's an example of someone who was very close to Jesus, denied him, yet made things right with God again and pressed on, allowing himself to make a difference for God in his kingdom with a newfound strength. He knew what to do. He wept bitterly. He repented. He was sincerely sorry for his actions. He turned back and grew in his faith, thereby allowing himself to now help others grow in their faith. And even though Peter failed, he didn't let this failure define him or be his ruin. I have one uh, final short clip right now that emphasizes that point, that even though Peter failed, he didn't let this failure define him or be his ruin. Please take a look. Strike three. Wow. 
I'm the greatest picture in the world. <laughs> Optimism. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. I really like that clip. Sometimes it's all in the way we look at things, isn't it? You see, God doesn't look at our past, at our failures, only what we are going to do about them and where we are now going. And when we strike out, God doesn't wish us to dwell on this fact, but he wants us to put it behind us by looking at things another way, by forgetting, by asking forgiveness or by repenting, by persevering, or simply by moving forward. He wants us to pick up the bat and ball again and get back into the game. I would like to conclude this morning with a final illustration that lets us know how much God cares for us despite our failures. It's about a boy in Little League Baseball who is not very good at the game. Now, between the last clip and this story I'm about to tell you, you'll know why I've been using so many baseball references. It was the last game of the Little League series, and this was it. They could win it all today or lose everything. The boy's entire family came to watch. His father was there, his mother was there, his blind old uncle was there. Um, the aunt who gives the really wet kisses, she was there as well. You know, his siblings, you know, they were there. And they were all there to cheer him and his team on. And the boy comes up to bat, and his father was up in the stands, and he was cheering. He, he was saying, you can do it, son. You can do it. And the boy gets up to the plate and strike one and strike two and strike three. You're out. Later in the game, he comes up again. And a similar thing happens. He gets up to the plate, gets up to bat, he swings, strike one. Strike two, strike three, you're out. Moving ahead towards the end of the game, it's now the last inning. His team's up and there are two outs. And he's up to bat once more. This is it, they'll either win it now or they'll lose it and it's all up to this boy. The little boy's up to bat again, and his father is cheering again. He's saying, you can do it, son. You can do it. Strike one. Strike two. Strike three. You're out. And the boy struck out, and he lost the game for his team. Now, he heard many comments like, you're nothing. You're a loser. You're just no good. You can't do anything right. And the boy knows that he messed up. And he goes to the bench, goes into the dugout, and he begins to cry. He's feeling worthless and is at a complete low. He probably feels a little bit like Peter did, letting his, his team and himself down. And everybody leaves except for his family. And about 15 or 20 minutes later, you know, as he's sitting in the dugout, sobbing, he hears his dad say, Come on, son. The game isn't over. The game isn't over. And he looks up, and he sees his entire family has taken positions on the field. Even his blind old uncle is out there in the outfield. And the boy thinks to himself, oh, Dad, what are you talking about? The game was over 15 or 20 minutes ago. Pick up the bat, son. The game isn't over, he hears his father say. And the boy picks up the bat, and his father pitches. Strike one. Strike two. Strike three. Strike four. Strike five. Strike six. Strike seven. But eventually, he gets a hit, and his father yells, Run! He puts down the bat and he runs and the ball was hit near his vital uncle who misses it completely and picks up and fumbles it and throws it to someone else and he, meanwhile he's rounding first, he's rounding second, and he's rounding third and he makes it home, gets a home run. And the boy's father says to him, I told you you could do it, son. I told you you could do it. Now I tell you this story to, to make a point. Now this is the English teacher, you know, you know in me now coming out here. Um, because there are a lot of symbolism and references in this story. Does anyone know what the game represents? Yeah, the game symbolizes life. And striking out are our lows, whatever they may be, like the story of Peter we've been discussing or our failures that we've been referring to. And the father, who does the father represent? Yeah, the father represents God, telling us you're good, you're special, I have something in mind for you. How about the family, his family who's there? Who are they like? Yeah, they're like the church. They're like their fellow Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ. They're to encourage us. How about those who make fun of him? Those who say he's worthless or he's nothing or he's a loser. That's the world, exactly. It's similar to the devil saying, you're no good. Hey everyone, the next time the devil points his bony finger at you and says you're no good, reach up and in Jesus' name, break his finger. 
because Satan wants us to be and feel defeated. But Jesus says, you are good. You're special. So special that he gave himself up for you. And if you struck out, no matter how many times, he's there to restore you like he did Peter. Jesus is there to encourage you to press on, to continue in your Christian life. He's asking you to pick up the bat and ball and get back into the game. Because in reference to all of my failures I spoke of at the beginning of this message, I bought my mom flowers and apologized for something I said to her and repaired our relationship. I passed my driver's test the second time. I switched from math to history and understood my academic strengths and limitations better. I'm still seeing God work in my former ministry to youth. One of my um, former youth um, members is doing a church plant for youth out in Esquimalt. One of the other youth who came to our church and youth group a little bit as well as Mike, who's here serving in, in youth ministry. I have had a number of successes as both a teacher and a vice principal. I've learned not to take my family, friendships, and relationships for granted. And I continue to work on and grow in my relationship with Christ. You see, Peter failed, but Christ still built his church on him. He gave him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And God wants to give you something too. At least he may be waiting to. But he doesn't want our failures to be what defines us because that leads to discouragement and a life on the sidelines. He doesn't want us to be pouty players either, nor does he want us warming a bench, allowing our failures to consume us or being ineffective in furthering his church or his kingdom. He wants us in the game because the most important thing in baseball is not the number of times we strike out, but rather the number of good plays and hits, especially those home runs that we make. And here is the final thought. Through Peter's betrayal of Jesus, Peter learned, grew, and God still built his church, this church even. And from what you have learned and how you have grown in your struggles and in your failures, what part of God's church can be built with you? Thank you, and God bless.